the Recycling and Waste Management Division regarding an amendment to the Solid Waste Management Charges and Regulations Bylaw 2108. And there's a recommendation that Solid Waste Management Charges and Regulations Amendment Bylaw Number 4230 be forwarded to the Board for consideration of three readings and adoption. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Moving on now to, oh, is there any unfinished business? No unfinished business, but we have two new business items. Yep. Moving on to NB1. From the Environmental Services Division, this is regarding the environmentally sensitive areas strategy, and Mr. Moore is here with the presentation. Welcome, Mr. Moore. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I'll try to go through this fairly quickly, recognizing that uh, it is uh, getting late in the day and we've got another uh, meeting, you've all got another meeting ahead of you. Um, I'm here to talk today about uh, environmentally sensitive areas strategy for the region, which is something that our division's been working on uh, over the past few months. Uh, start off talking about why, why would we want an environmentally, area, environmentally sensitive areas? I'm going to be calling them ESAs quite a bit, so I don't try to spit out those words. Um, and, and why should we have one? So uh, what we're talking about here is a variety of different types of ecosystems. They can be uh, uh, really uh, small, fragile ecosystems. Uh, Gary Oak comes to mind. Uh, things like uh, wetlands. They can also be areas that are identified as critical habitat for species at risk. So if there's some uh, ecosystem that uh, supports a specific uh, endangered species, then that could be considered an ESA as well. And areas that are under pressure from development. So what an ESA strategy would look like is an inventory of these areas across the region and a plan to de protect a network of them. Um, there's increasing recognition, uh, both within the public, uh, within the, uh, the division, that uh, a healthy functioning ecosystem is foundational uh, for the health of watersheds and for our communities. We heard that earlier today in the uh, discussion about the drinking water and watershed protection function. Uh, we also have a responsibility as a local government to protect this critical habitat. Um, if it's identified by the federal government as being um, important under the Species at Risk Act, then everyone, including local government and private landowners, have a responsibility not to, uh, to damage that habitat. And also, as I said, residents of the CVRD have identified the importance of this. Um, the strategy would be <coughs> embedded within a larger regional conservation strategy. So identifying these areas and then um, a, a larger strategy with input from the board would be to say, well, we've, uh, we've found out that we've got these areas, they're, they're important, what should we do about it? Um, how much of them and which ones should we be looking at protecting? And we look at this on two scales. On a region-wide context, making sure that we've got enough areas, representative areas of different types of ecosystem, and that we've got a network that has connectivity. Because there, there's no sense in protecting little islands all over the place if the species that are using these areas can't move from one to the other. Uh, simple ecosystem biology. Um, but also at, at the site level, where there, there's certain features, if we are talking maybe some of these Gary Oak or, or wildflower meadows, where you've got really important sites and you have to look at the specific characteristics of what's important at a site and, and how to protect the, the values that are associated with that. And these also fit in nicely in the regional context within the watershed management plans that watersheds um, make a, a really convenient uh, landscape unit at which to do the, this type of planning. So the uh, ESA strategy fits within the larger watershed management planning. To do this work, uh, we hired Madrone um, Environmental Services to do the first steps towards an ESA strategy for the region. And they did two pieces. The first piece that they did was an inventory of ESAs across the region. So they took all the existing data that's out there, a lot from the province, from some other work that we've done, um, and, and they looked at how they can put it all together to get a, a consistent layer across the region of the ESAs. 
And then they also did a, a pilot, more detailed study. Um, they picked the uh, Shawnigan area where they went in and they tried to clean up some of this data uh, using the air photos, uh, getting rid of areas that might have once been a, a, a nice forest stand that's been developed into something else. It's not a sensitive area anymore. Cleaning up some of the boundaries. Maybe there were some stands that were missed by uh, previous studies so they could add those in. And then they gave us some recommendations. So this is what it looks like on a big scale. Obviously, you can't make a whole lot out of that. Um, it is available for the public, for all of you to have a look at, for groups that are doing work in their areas. This inventory is available as a resource to uh, uh, dig in more deeply. The other thing that uh, Madrone did with this inventory is started looking at the analysis of the inventory. What does it tell us? And we can look at it at a number of different scales. We can look across the whole region. We can zoom in by watershed. We can look at the different biogeochromatic zones. We could also, if we chose to, look at it by different jurisdictions. And we see a different picture. So if we look across the whole region, what we see is you know, we're doing pretty well. We've got about 27% of the region is within these environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, a lot of it is uh, old forests, mature forests. But there's a huge difference as we look across the region, and you probably saw the, the different patterns on that map on the last one. If we just were to contrast the East Coast versus the West Coast, on the East side, obviously, we've got huge provincial and national parks, not a lot of development. Uh, so we've got over 40% of the land there is within, uh, within ESAs. 37% uh, of that's old forests, lots of mature forests. Contrast that with the more developed east side where we've only got about 18% that's in these sensitive areas and, and the types of areas that we've got are a lot different. If we were to zoom in again and look just at the coastal Douglas fir, the narrow strip along the coast which has most, both the development pressures and is one of the most endangered ecosystems, uh, it's about 1% uh, there that's left in, in old growth forests. So the, the pattern and the way of looking at it might not be good enough just to say at a, at a regional level we're doing really well, let's pat ourselves on the back. There, we can drill down a lot more into it. Um, and, and why we want to do that is it really feeds into the questions of how do we set these targets? How much land should be protected? At what scale do we set the targets? And how do we prioritize which uh, of these ESAs should we be looking at first? That is sort of the, the what of uh, the ESA strategy. And the, the other piece that we asked Madrone to do was the how, and looking at the tools that are available. What they did is they uh, did a few pieces. They looked at other places in the province. What other strategies are out there? So Comox, just north of us, has a really good uh, conservation strategy that they've prepared. Lots of buy-in from the community. It was developed by community groups and all the different uh, uh, municipalities in the regional district are all supportive of that region-wide strategy. Uh, they also, another good example was uh, from the South Okanagan, Similkumi, and they have a biodiversity strategy. Then they looked at the existing CVRD municipal policies and tools and came up with some recommendations for the scope, structure, and targets for the ESA. So one of the things, when they looked at what does the CVRD have in terms of policies and the member municipalities, um, they were building actually on a lot of the work that, that, that Chloe started when she was a, working as a co-op student for us. And, and they found uh, a, a few highlights here that a lot of our OCPs, we have language about conservation of of uh, ESAs. We have urban or village containment boundaries, and we do have some environmental development permit areas, or these EDPAs. Uh, at a minimum, we've got them for the riparian areas to meet the RAR regulations. Some weaknesses is, um, as, as we keep seeing, there's all kinds of inconsistent policies among the different OCPs within the electoral areas and within the municipalities. The EDPAs that we've got tend to focus on specific types of environmentally sensitive areas rather than looking at the big picture at a network at connectivity. And most areas lack tools such as development approval information area bylaws, which would um, allow us to get a lot more information from developers for us to be able to say, well, there's sensitive areas there. You need to give us a bunch of information about what is there so that we know how development can still move forward while still protecting those values. 
they also came up with some opportunities. There's interest from both within the CBRD and we also had the uh, member municipalities involved in this process at developing a region-wide strategy. And we've also got a, a, a ton of stewardship groups which are act active in the valley that are developing their own conservation plans uh, that are at the land trusts and stuff that are already protecting areas. So there's a lot there to build on. Uh, and then there's also some challenges, the, uh, the lack of mapping. Uh, you might have noticed on that map that I flashed up quickly, there's kind of a hole through the middle. We don't have a lot of information from the private man managed forest lands um, about uh, where the, the sensitive areas might be on their lands. We've got all these multiple jurisdictions across the region. We all know how complex it is. And we have different levels of responsibility and influence over land use in different parts of the region. Uh, EDPAs in general, there's limited capacity to enforce them, and limited funds as always. So Madrone gave us some recommendations. Uh, there's a lot more than this that are contained in the reports, just some highlights. They're suggesting that we set targets both at a region-wide level and also at a watershed scale. And again, the watersheds, they're nice contained boundaries and they're a, uh, a landscape, a geography that we're using um, for other land use planning. And some other suggestions uh, for tools that we can use, looking at the growth boundaries, development approvals, and EDPAs. Uh, also considering restorative development, so not just looking at existing uh, areas, but looking at areas that have already been disturbed in the past, um, can these move forward? So example, so looking at younger forest stands, if, if there's ecological values associated with them to become uh, mature or old growth forests in the future. Some next steps moving forward with the ASA strategy is uh, more mapping. So expanding that detailed pilot mapping across the other area. And we've also recently got the uh, province's released vegetation res uh, resource inventory for almost the entire region, which we didn't have in the past. It's great, it gives us a lot more insights what's out there, especially in, on the private forest lands. Um, and then an assessment, we know where the ESAs are. Now let's look at which ones are already protected, which jurisdictions are they in, and which ones should we focus on, uh, on protecting in the future. Setting the targets, so building that bigger conservation strategy, and looking at the tools. And this fits in nicely with uh, some of the other work going on within land use services to harmonize OCPs and look at uh, development permits that we can look at some consistent region-wide uh, EDPAs that can work towards protecting some of these areas. Also some covenants, we, uh, it's been before the board in the past, uh, conservation tax incentive programs to give landowners some tools to protect uh, ESAs on their private lands. And I will leave it at that. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Jeff, and that was for information. I, Director Kuhn, do you have a question? Yeah, I would like to know how much did that study cost and who paid for it? Through the chair, it was uh, just under $30,000 for the, the work that Madrone did, and it was through the Environmental uh, Services Division budget. And there's going to be, you say, another study done or more studies to fill in the gaps that, that were there. How much do you expect to spend on that? Uh, I think we, uh, we have uh, a, sim a similar amount budgeted uh, to, uh, to continue either with some mapping or with some other work on this. Thank you. Okay, oh, Director Nicholson, Director Marsh. Thanks, Jeff. Um, this is really important work. This is just basic information that most uh, regional districts have had for 20 years. And, uh, you know, we can't get this done fast enough. And having the experience of trying to do an official community plan review without basic uh, environmental information for our area is it's just been crazy actually so I really appreciate this and I'm wondering when we can expect the more detailed work the planning work to happen what's the timeline um, well with uh, within this year we'd like to take some next steps uh, f for some of the additional mapping we're just uh, trying to look the, this uh, the VRI just came out so uh, we're looking at how that can change the, the mapping that we did so that we can bring in that, that information for the other areas and then balancing it against um, which areas do we want to do. Um, we also want to look at uh, the 
you know, it, it might be most important to look at the developed areas um, that is where there's the highest pressures and could be some of the priorities. Follow up, Director Nicholson. I just like to also add that it, we spend an awful lot of money on parks, and if th this is sort of fundamental information to um, planning your park system, because you want to maximize the benefit of the parks, not just for recreation but for environmental protection. So having Im this kind of information is just basic. Director Marsh. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Jeff. Uh, you probably did hear this through um, Keith, but d the Malahat Nation has a whole lot of data. I can't even remember the technical amount because I don't think in that, and they're willing to share. They don't know how to use it, and it's mostly on the south and the lakes. And Did you know about that? Yeah. Yeah, we have Good. heard about that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, because it's, it's just from the last two years, and they really would like to share it with people. You'd li I'd like to comment, uh, if, Kate. If I may, and then um, Director Atkin. Just, just going back to Director Nicholson's comment um, and the comment uh, for Director Kuhn as well, uh, we requested under the um, uh, the board's direction and priority area of the development of watershed management plans for at-risk watersheds. This is one of the fundamental pieces to inform that planning process. And we had requested 50000 in funding for this fiscal year with the uh, projected cost over the next three years of additional money to build that structured database. So this year's project was the foundational piece that was done here by Madrome to help inform future planning for next year. The other project under that program was a risk framework um, for watersheds to help us identify which watersheds were at most at risk. So you'll still hear the presentation on that one a little later in the fall, but that will complete this year's work under that funding program. Next year, we hope to continue it. Thank you for that clarification. Director Acton. So that was it. I was wondering what the connection was with the watershed function and, and that service. And then also, I guess, I don't know if this can be answered today, but how, again, how do we integrate this so that for our land use planning and also for land acquisition, we don't have a service to, to, to start acquiring some of these properties. So not really, I don't know if that's something you can answer right now. Regional districts that's don't. <laughs> You're wondering um, about um, land banks yeah. and owning? Yeah, Madam Chair, it's uh, the there is the Regional Park Acquisition Fund, which is the um, purview of, of the Parks and Trails Department. And they look at a lot of different factors in, in terms of acquiring properties. A lot of them are focused on community parks and also some in, in terms of parks that provide a lot of other values su such as this. And, and just note that par you know, parks are one way of protecting these values. Uh, it's great within a park, a, a value, uh, the uh, ESAs can be really well protected there. but. In reality, we have to look at a lot of tools beyond that and protecting um, the, other, the values associated, associated with the ESAs without putting them all within parks. Thank you so much. Moving on now, I don't see any other questions. Thank you, Jeff. Um, moving on now And Madam Chair, the, the final item, new business number two from the Recycling and Waste Management Division, 2018 Curbside Contamination Outreach. And the Environmental Resource Assistant is here for one more week, so that's why the timeliness of his report. Welcome, Tony Surfazi. Say for Surfaza. Surfaza. <laughs> See, I should have known that. Too. Well, good afternoon, yes. actually. Good I afternoon, to the, the team. Uh, we wanted actually to provide you with an update on the solid waste public education, and in particular, with our summer communication campaigns. Two of our staff, Tony and Chloe, actually were heavily involved in that, and Tony in particular did actually a great job. He's our summer student, co-op student. So by saying that, I asked him to walk you through this, and a phenomenal job. Actually, Chloe will start it off. Okay, I'll, I'll welcome Chloe. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Um, perfect. So. We just wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the education and outreach campaigns that have been going on here. 
So uh, as many of you, you might be aware already, um, we did an illegal dumping campaign in Shawnigan. We partnered with the province of BC and helped run their wood stove replacement program, um, as well as uh, run communications around air quality and open burning. Um, some of you might be aware that there's um, a Bear Aware Wild Safe campaign that we're partnering with. And notably, I guess over the summer, the curbside recycling contamination campaign and uh, communications campaign around a new stream of recycling accepted at depots. So just an overview of some of the tools that we use. Um, Ian's very excited about the rack cards, <laughs> um, as well as just posters in public places. Um, we partnered in Shawnigan to use community billboards for the illegal dumping campaign. We also run regular print ads, radio ads, uh, newspaper editorials, social media posts. Uh, we do some face-to-face -face outreach at community events and depots, um, and also do we're working on some educational videos, which will lead into Tony's work. Thank you. Uh, everyone, um, so as Chloe mentioned, there's a lot of initiatives that have taken place over the calendar year of 2018, but over the summer months of uh, May, June, July, and August, I've had the pleasure of working on a few campaigns. First off, the Other Flexible Plastic uh, campaign. So starting in June 2018, um, Recycle BC started to <coughs> accept this type of film plastic. So uh, Chloe and myself have done some outreach at Bings Creek and on Thetis Island. Uh, and have put together some educational videos for this type of film plastic. Next is Couch and Recycles app, which will roll out in the fall, which is a mobile app for people to check their um, curbside collection schedules and use the Recyclepedia tool to check, um, to check to see where each recyclable item should go. So uh, residents can download that. And lastly, um, curbside contamination, which is a really important issue for the division so we've actually gone out and done some audits. Some audits have been done not across the CBRD, but um, in certain, certain areas, and contaminated totes have been uh, actually um, turned away. So with that, also curbside recycling contamination that we've done a series of videos as well. So we want to take the opportunity to show you one of those videos. This one's posted on our Facebook page at my CBRD. It's gaining quite a bit of traction, so we thought we'd take the opportunity to show this to you. There is an issue with curbside recycling, and the CBRD needs your help. Here's what's happening. Every day the CBRD picks up curbside recycling, and every day there are contaminants found in curbside totes. But what is contamination anyway? Contamination is a term used to describe things that are being placed in recycling that shouldn't be. In fact, 15% of all CBRD curbside recycling is contaminated or has an item in it that shouldn't be there. So what are these items? Here are five common contaminants found in curbside recycling. Number five, garden hoses. Long stringy items can wrap around mechanical sorting equipment and clog the machines. Hoses unfortunately need to be placed in the garbage or you can donate them. Number four, styrofoam. Similar to film plastic, foam packaging is recyclable, but only at designated retail locations and drop-off depots. Styrofoam in your curbside tote crumbles, and the little bits of foam cannot be separated from other items. Number three, electronics. Most electronics and batteries are recyclable at drop-off depots, but should never be placed in your curbside recycling tote. Dangerous toxic chemicals are released from batteries when materials compacted in the truck. Bring electronics and batteries to your local drop-off depot. Number two, glass. Glass is recyclable, just not in your curbside tote. This is due to the health and safety of CBRD workers. Broken glass can be dangerous and cause harm to the men and women picking up your recycling, so please bring all glass to your local drop-off depot. Number one, film plastics plastic bags and overwrap, and other flexible plastic. And why can't these be recycled at curbside? Because they often get caught in sorting machinery and can bring the whole operation to a halt. Bring all film plastic to your local drop-off depot. 
visit us online or call our recycling hotline today. Thanks from the CVRD. Thank you so much, Tony. I know I did receive a lot of comments on my Facebook page on that. So, and, and we always have questions on the garbage and recycling, but I did have one, um, the website. So somebody in my, a resident in my area went on the Recyclepedia and then it directs you to the CVRD website where she said she went to Fisher Road and it was really clear, but when she, she's actually looking to dispose of a toilet and she couldn't find it anywhere, but the website for CVRD, she found it more challenging. So I don't know if there's a different, if there's another way or if the hotline or whatever. Can you come to the podium, just to the microphone, thanks. And if you could tell me where the toilets can be. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working to update the website and with the launch of the um, new Couch and Recycles mobile app, there's gonna be two web apps that are a part of it, which is an updated Recyclopedia, which contains more items and it's easier to search for the items and it tells you the exact disposal instructions. And also just to let you know, if, there, if items are not within that, there's an option to recommend that we update it and include this item. So we'll be getting all that information and can regularly add more uh, items to that list. So that'll replace the new, um, the older couch and recyclopedia. Great, thank you. And a toilet? And a toilet. You can bring it to any of the CBRD recycling centers and it'll go in one of the rubble categories, but I can't remember if it's stream rubble. one or two. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> and you're doing a great job. Director Morrison. Uh, just real quickly, uh, given the time, uh, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, I, th I think you've done a great job and uh, appreciate all the work you've done. And, and Chloe as well, I uh, hauled that board that many of you have seen in the, uh, in the lunchroom around to a couple of community events and uh, there was a great deal of interest. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen the rack card, check it out because I think it's going to be one of those things that people can put on their fridge and they will know for sure about what goes in their curbside and what doesn't. And, you know, just kind of joking a little bit, but you know, the glamorous life of, of an elected official, I got an invitation from our friend, Mr. Adair to come down to Bings Creek on a hot, smelly, smoky Friday afternoon <laughs> to see the curbside from electoral area, uh, the curbside recycling dumped on, on the floor at, uh, at Bings Creek. And I was shocked at the contamination that was in there. It was unbelievable. Mm. And yet with staff standing around, they were saying, you know what? This isn't really that bad. Some of your neighboring electoral areas have some issues. <laughs> so we've got a lot of work to do on, on improving this. And I really hope that, uh, that staff or that elected officials will take the time, go and see what, what they're facing uh, at Bings Creek. And also I'm hoping the next board We'll take a tour up to Nanaimo and see the facilities that handle a lot of what we're, we're dealing with as far as recycling because if, if everybody knew what was going in there, we would, uh, we'd be shocked. So with yeah. that, thank you very much for all thank your Thank you, Director work. Morrison. Yeah, we've uh, uh, Area D as well. So we've been working really hard. We're going to be having a community conversation specifically on that. Director Jackson. Just very briefly, because I'm starving to death. Um, we had a real problem in Duncan with the same kind of thing you're discussing, c contamination. We were always at 15 or just over percent, uh, um, over that, and uh, we were about to get fined. And so the, the guys that pick it up were, were relentless, and now we're well under 3%, so it's just the relentlessness part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sorry, just to speak to uh, the chair. Um, is this off? Or it's on. Still, still on. There is going to be another, well, there's multiple videos that are coming out, another video that's coming out. We actually toured the Nanaimo facility, so where your recycling goes, so it actually walks everyone through every step. So that, and the, and the rack cards, yeah. The rack cards are going to be coming out in the Couch and Valley Citizen on August 31st. There's Great. Thank you very much. We look forward to it, and thank you again. And thank you for your work here, Tony. Thank you very much. Okay, we're moving on now to question period. A question shall be addressed to the chair and must be truly a question and not statements of opinions. Is there any questions from the gallery? 
Oh, thank you, because everyone's so hungry. <laughs> thank you so much. So um, I'd like to uh, motion to adjourn. Been moved, seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Just, just a note. The board, the board meeting will be 1:45. I don't think anybody heard it, but.